Okay, I think we're some people are having trouble logging in, but we have a we still got about 80 people here. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, want to welcome everybody to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We also um, are spinning this off in conjunction with the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, trying to make sure that we are continuing while we take care of our patients with COVID, um, understanding that we also have patients who don't have COVID, understanding that there's a lot that we don't know about COVID that we can continue to learn about, and also making sure that we are also continuing as lifelong learners and trying to improve every day in terms of how we can take care of all of our patients. So we've had a great few grand rounds. Um, our first grand rounds uh, almost a month ago was Claire, our own Claire Phillip, who gave us a um, fascinating discussion on the pathogenesis and treatment of COVID-related coagulopathy. We had Ira Bedzo from um, New York uh, Medical School who talked to us about bioethics of taking care of patients with COVID. And uh, last week we had Jack Cush, who's a uh, rheumatologist at University of Texas Southwestern, who gave us a rheumato rheumatologist perspective on both cytokine storm and the medications that we can use to take care of patients with COVID. Um, so today we're continuing. We have uh, Dr. Andrew Brooks, who uh, comes to us from not too far away. Dr. Brooks is um, in the Department of Genetics. He's a professor in the Department of Genetics at Rutgers University. He's also the Chief Operating Officer and Director of Technology Development for the company that uh, developed the um, utilization of saliva as the primary test biomaterial for detecting the SARS COVID-2 coronavirus. And this is the first, uh, the first that was approved by the FDA for testing. So before I turn it over to our fantastic pulmonary critical care fellow, Natalia Levitska, who's going to go through a case, um, I wanted to remind everybody that we have everybody on mute just to make everything a little more simple and streamlined. And during this, um, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat bar. They'll go directly to me. And once at the end of the grand rounds, after Dr. Brooks has presented his um, his portion of the session, we will circulate these questions to both Natalia and Dr. Brooks to answer. And without uh, any, any further delay, Natalia, you can go over, go ahead and take over the, the, sh the screen sharing. Sounds good. Just let me know if you can see it. Not yet. Okay. Oh, no. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be presenting a case uh, that we saw in the pulmonary consults as well as uh, in the ICU later on that just highlights the challenges of diagnosing COVID-19. So we have a patient. He's a 78-year-old male. He has a history of acute AML, currently undergoing chemotherapy, who presented to the emergency department for evaluation of fevers of 100.6. Patient otherwise reported chills, but denied cough, shortness of breath, body aches, diarrhea, or dysuria. So he basically got sent by his hematologist. Um, review systems was otherwise negative. As you can see, this is not the healthiest guy. So he also has a history of prostate cancer in the past. He has a history of cirrhosis, had a liver transplant in 2003. He also had a kidney transplant in 2014. And he is on a couple of immunosuppressants, so tacrolimus and prednisone, as well as on chemotherapy, which is cytobine and ven venetoclax. This patient has received his chemotherapy about two weeks prior to admission. So on physical exam, some things to note is just his blood pressure is borderline low, 98 over 60, but Otherwise, his vitals were normal. He was a febrile. He was saturating 98% in room air. And the physical exam per admission chart was noted to be unremarkable. Uh, looking at his lab, some things to note, his scheme, uh, his BMP was relatively normal. He has pancytopenia with a white blood cell count of 0.4, and he has no neutrophils on the diff. Um, he also, also had a low hemoglobin 6.2, his choke was slightly elevated, his INR was slightly elevated as well, which you can expect in a patient with EML. And also his COVID-19 testing was done on admission and was negative. Looking at the x-ray, um, there's 
really it's a pretty normal x-ray. The only thing to note is that he has a pick line on the right hand side. So in terms of the hospital course, the patient is admitted. He started on um, treatment for neutropenic fever with vancomycin and cefepime. He's also given a blood transfusion. On hospital day three, patient develops new onset dyspnea, and we get an x-ray which looks remarkably worse than the x-ray in admission with uh, bilateral patchy alveolar opacities. So at that point, COVID-19 testing is again repeated and it is negative. Um, he is diuresed for pulmonary edema, given that he received a blood transfusion and he was given some fluids. Um, the team also sent some fungal studies and started him on treatment with mycofungin. For chart review during this time, the patient was just having low gray temperatures of 100.1, but otherwise no true fever. So um, at this point, the team got a CAT scan. Sorry. So as you can see, he has a pretty significant um, patchy opacities. It's mostly in the peripheral and central distribution, but throughout both lungs which in a patient who is immunosuppressed, um, the differential is pretty broad. Pulmonary was consulted at this point and patient underwent a bronchoscopy uh, with uh, biopsies and the BL of the right upper lobe. So uh, per bronchoscopy note, they also uh, mostly noted clotted blood throughout the bronchial, tracheobronchial tree, but no discrete lesions or sources of bleeding. All of his studies were essentially negative and the lung biopsy pathology was unremarkable as well. So after the bronchoscopy patient actually reported feeling a little bit better. Um, and just some things to know during his hospitalization, which again, in an AML patient is, you know, you don't really know what to make of it. His D-dimer was climbing, his fibrinogen was climbing, his ferritin was climbing, as well as his C-reactive protein. And then on hospital day eight, patient develops worsening shortness of breath and hypoxia. Now he's requiring an underbreather and nasal cannula. His COVID-19 testing is repeated for the third time and it is now positive. And as you can see, his x-ray is significantly worse than it was on, um, throughout his hospitalization. So patient is admitted to the MICU. He's then developing worsening hypoxemia. He's intubated um, and mechanically ventilated. And unfortunately the patient um, passed his family with due care because he had, uh, the team had very uh, big difficulty oxygenating him and ventilating him as well. So this case is just highlighting um, the challenges of um, diagnosing COVID-19. Um, and also um, just points out that even though patients might be negative initially, it is still important to maintain our precautions during hospitalization as you know, a lot of staff was exposed to this patient. Um, throughout. So now I'm going to pass the talk to Dr. Brooks. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for, um, uh, for inviting me to uh, come and share with you our, our journey um, with respect to COVID-19 and um, the molecular testing uh, that we've been involved with, which has been um, an interesting experience. Um, the, the title of the talk is Innovation Under Pressure. Um, I can show you why that is. For our medical war against the virus, the FDA has now authorized the first steps developed by researchers from Rutgers University that can use saliva from patients, the first one, these tests can be self-administered by patients in healthcare settings, which will reduce exposure for medical workers and safe personal protective equipment. Rutgers will begin processing 10,000 tests daily. So by using saliva, that's the first, they'll be able to do things in terms of speed and ease that we haven't been able to do before. So a lot of great innovation is taking place during this period of time. And that's innovation, I call it, Innovation under pressure. It's a big difference. Innovation under pressure, right? Cleveland Clinic knows all about that. You wouldn't accept an incomplete job from anyone else. So why accept it from your allergy pills? So oh, let me end this. Go back to sharing here. Can everybody see my screen? 
Yes. Okay, great. So um, a little bit of an explanation of uh, innovation under pressure and um, the process in which we developed and implemented this approach really leans on you know 20 years worth of experience in working with biomaterials and the kind of work that we do. There is a lot we still need to learn about SARS-CoV-2 or, or COVID-19 detection and immunity. And even the interpretation of results um, is still not that straightforward. Um, there's some things that we know about coronaviruses. Certainly from a sequence standpoint, there's a lot of sequencing work that's going on. We understand that there are, are multiple strains and are trying to figure out, you know, certainly um, how this happened and what it means. But there are a lot of things from an interpretation standpoint from testing um, that we don't fully understand. And we're throwing a lot of time and resources um, in the development of different kinds of tests that will allow us to more sensitively and specifically um, identify uh, COVID infections and uh, resulting immunity, um, as well as how they really intersect with the, the clinical course of, uh, of care. So I'm gonna tell you a little about RUCDR and, and what we've done um, and show you how we got to the data that led to uh, the first EUA approval with the second being really an incremental advance allowing us to, instead of bringing patients to a test, bring the tests um, uh, to a patient. So RUCDR Infinite Biologics is a, a next-gen central laboratory. Um, we're also a diagnostic service provider. Um, we've had a CLIA lab for many, many years. However, uh, the outward facing component of that CLIA lab was really to develop um, uh, tests, laboratory developed tests for a lot of our pharma and biotech clients, uh, even for um, some work that we do with the NIH to be able to provide tools for inclusion and exclusion criteria for clinical trials, um, as well as some more uh, standard clinical testing. However, uh, we were not, and, and I still don't consider ourselves a reference lab. However, um, we very soon will have the largest single lab capacity at a site as an independent um, uh, company uh, with respect to throughput for, for COVID testing. And one of the things to point out, as you can imagine, as the, the president had pointed out, that was a month ago or a little over a month ago, that we, we would be able to run 10,000 tests a day. Um, in the next three weeks, uh, once we're done with the recent expansion that was announced by the governor on Monday, uh, we will far exceed 50,000 samples a day. Um, this is a different kind of advancement, um, not necessarily a, a technical advancement, but more of an operational and lab services advancement. And today we're really gonna focus on, on the technical side of this. But one thing to point out is RUCDR at its core uh, has always been a very large biobank, being the federal repository for many, many, many NIH institutes, um, which was started by, by Jay Tishfield, probably I think it's now over 20 years ago. So a, a lot of the core services with being able to handle samples uh, already exist at RUCDR, which made this possible. Um, the, the, the long history of RUCDR as a, as a grant recipient and contract recipient for federal research funding, which began with the genetic basis of common diseases, has expanded um, to be more of uh, applied research, uh, transitioning to applications of what we now know as precision medicine with the technologies that allow us to use these samples in ways that we haven't before. Um, what we do is, is really manage the sample life cycle. And that's really critical as we think about COVID testing because there are a lot of components that have led to what people like to consider false negatives or even false positives. But every component of this sample life cycle from the time that you plan about when to collect it how to collect it, um, which is really what the, uh, the saliva um, advancement is, how we transport it, um, then ultimately how we process it, store it, and then retrieve it um, is, is critical. Um, I know uh, a lot of you, if you write orders, even though you might have had some experience in the lab, may not fully understand, and you really shouldn't if we're doing our job correctly, uh, all of the components that are critical um, for getting those test results. So when we built out a platform and when we apply things even to COVID testing, 
it's got to be science first. Do we have the right technology for nucleic acid extraction? Uh, how do we do that? Uh, how do we build a process to get from something above the line here that's very manual to something that's, that's very automated? And there are different levels of expertise um, at each of these stages. Uh, one of the, the key components of the COVID testing process is the nucleic acid extraction. So many years ago, there were different instruments and different technologies that were geared at different sample types. And, and we've been working with this company, Chemogen, now for about 15 years on a, a biopolymer approach to standardizing nucleic acid extraction. And, and this was a really big key in getting the proficiency and the quality uh, and, and the sensitivity, quite honestly, of the COVID testing that we've seen, such that just about any biomaterial can use a single platform in order to get the result. So what we were able to do very quickly is take a platform that was used for genomic DNA extraction with some optimization, immediately apply it to viral RNA. And then it raised the question is, what's the best material to use? So again, you know, the, the core of, of RUCDR and what makes us, us different as a, um, a service provider and a, um, a collaborator and a partner in the space is we spend all of our time thinking about all the things that you can get out of, cut out of, pull off of an individual. And you know, there are many different applications or many different downstream applications that depend on multiple biomaterials. So um, what we do is we work with our partners to identify all of the different things you can do from a single blood sample. Years ago, from a blood sample, nobody really appreciated or knew that there were cell-free or circulating nucleic acid that would be used today for um, uh, early detection for cancer, used for um, uh, prenatal um, uh, diagnosis or, or for assessment of um, a genetic disorders in any pregnancy. Quite honestly, sooner than, than you would even know that um, uh, you were pregnant from cell-free nucleic acid. Uh, and then on to looking at other biomaterials or making the most out of them. And the challenge here was looking at the method for sample collection that's traditionally been used, which is, is right here, the nasopharyngeal swab, um, for not only accurate detection, but the sheer volume of, uh, of people that have to be collected. And, and I've had this slide for a while and keep updating the numbers, but uh, after the last two and a half months, it means a lot more to me than it did when I originally put it together. And we used to show this slide uh, with respect to using different kind of omics-based analyses to understand health versus disease or the efficacy of treatment, you know, targeted clinical trials, looking at mechanism of action. And the challenge that we used to present or that we still do is how we effectively manage the numbers of samples that will be required to accomplish this. And what COVID has done is it pushed this immediately from a concept and an idea to the forefront of what many labs have never contemplated before would need to be true. So in 2019, if you look at the roughly 342 million people in the US, there were 126 million hospital visits, close to a billion doctor's office visits, and about 13 billion diagnostic tests with less than 10% that were molecular analyses of the kind over here, mostly around epigenome and, and, and genomic analyses. So, you know, the infrastructure just by this statistic doesn't exist for the concept of potentially screening 300 million people a day. And, and that's something certainly we'll never achieve and not something I'm recommending. But even if you imagine on an average five biological samples that you could take from each person, if you wanted to have a, a personal biobank, if you will, and I'll show you a slide later on that kind of defines that concept, it would be 4.4 billion samples a year that we would have to manage and perform some kind of analysis. And imagine that if every year for your annual checkup, you know, or, or if you were sick and, and you know, went to see your, your, uh, your GP, you collected another five aliquots. And you know, to take some urine, some stool, uh, some blood, make some DNA and some plasma, right there you have five for a 50 year lifespan to store, that's 220 billion samples that you'd have to manage for every year of that population. So 
molecular samples will far exceed the number of paraffin blocks that we collect by orders of magnitude. But this idea of mass collection and processing is something that we were thrust into. And, and just to give you some perspective on samples that are collected in a similar manner. So if you look, uh, these are all companies that do direct to consumer kinds of analyses. And if you look at their samples per year, I, I haven't updated this since 2018, but even if you look at the largest providers that are using saliva as, as a collection for DNA, and we're using that same biomaterial for COVID testing, and you look at the number of samples that were genotyped, you're looking at about 14, 16 or so million in total. Now you compare and contrast that to a similar collection for a nasopharyngeal kind of collection or oropharyngeal, it, it's, it's, it's massive. Um, not to mention if you just use saliva for this test and still have to, to hold on to that sample, these companies have built massive infrastructure and have worked with companies like ours to provide that testing in order to accomplish that. Now within two weeks time, you're expected to see a similar kind of result. So how do we do this? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of innovation. Um, there's a lot on the testing side, but also on the, on the lab side. So for some of the direct-to-consumer applications we've worked on, we started a number of innovation projects with very large life sciences customers. This is one with Perkin Elmer, who owns Chemogen that I just mentioned for the extraction chemistry. And we needed to get to a solution that would process large volumes of samples at low cost, but with a certain level of precision, given that Ancestry.com uh, un until the COVID crisis and 23andMe would process tens of thousands of samples a day, but not across the number of labs that are required for the volumes um, for COVID testing. So we built this discovery platform uh, with Perkin Elmer. Um, it's a rail-based system. It, it may look big, but um, it fits in the size of a, um, you know, kind of a, a one bedroom New York City kitchen, to give you some perspective for size. Um, and it can do 10,000 small scale extractions a day that allow us to go on to do testing. So we've had this in place for a year. It was this kind of, you know, I don't want to say foresight, but it was these, this kind of advances that we've been involved in that allowed us to kind of catapult into the testing that was, was required immediately. And what we're going to see now for testing is people want to get back to work. We want to get people back to campus. We want to make sure that, you know, our healthcare professionals, our first responders um, get a priority for, for testing as um, we build this capacity so that we can continue to be safe is going to be impacted by all of these other healthcare markets that either tangentially or, or directly um, are, are requiring testing for all of their, their, their marketplaces. So, you know, you probably have seen recent announce, announcements for pharmacy chains that are offering COVID testing, um, a number of women's health and men's health platforms that have turned uh, their businesses, certainly diagnostics and the direct-to-consumer genomic companies um, that are all now in, in this place trying to help people um, get the testing that they need. Um, and that creates all kinds of, of new bottlenecks. But if, if we think of at-home testing for COVID-19, which was um, a goal of ours, which we accomplished a week ago with um, the amendment to our EUA, uh, and I'll tell you about our, our, our next goal towards the end, is, is really to expand the unique areas of, of at-home testing for molecular analysis, which, by the way, the process is no different for what we're, we're doing here for COVID testing. It, it still requires a physician to order it. It still requires an approved device with responsible, safe, and, and stability testing uh, to preserve that sample. And, and then it requires the appropriate um, a reporting and, and clinical follow-up. But now, you know, immediately we can add infectious disease to what ultimately was entertainment and genealogy with strides that were being made in, in risk assessment and polygenic risk scores to real diagnostic information about uh, the state of a patient. And, you know, it's not all lost on you because you've, you've taken a lot of these samples and, and you've had to look at the, the results from, from these tests, and you probably question them yourself from time to time, is that the biosample management here is critically important. And, and what we're learning, and, and this is where the false negatives come from, quite honestly, right? It's either the collection methodology, 
the test or how that sample is stored. Um, the collection methodology we're finding for COVID testing um, is critical. Our test is approved for saliva, but also for nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, nares, midturbinate, and also bronchoalveolar lavage. Um, because at the end of the day, once you collect that sample, the process in the extraction is, is the same. So when people ask us about the sensitivity of, of the assay that we run, it's at 200 copies per ml. That does not change given how that sample is collected. However, the matrix that that sample in can have an impact on the processing and quality of that sample. So it really is, you know, the, the triangle, which we've heard before, which is critical to making sure that we have the most reproducible and robust testing. So, you know, why not just stick with the gold standard? Um, a number of reasons. For any of us that have either, you know, taken a sample for an MP or, or received one, not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, not to mention that when the pandemic really was in full swing and, and they're still extremely limiting, Copan and Puritan and other swab manufacturers didn't have the capacity to come close to even keeping up along with all of the media. In fact, um, we went through an exercise collaboratively with an incredible study that's going on at Rutgers looking at asymptomatic um, uh, patients uh, and following them for uh, many months from, from the, the beginning of this whole um, ordeal, uh, they, made their own, they made their own media uh, for a few of them um, and uh, did it responsibly. We tested with the test and everything else, but, but you just couldn't buy it. So I'll come back to saliva being a more robust sample in a moment, but one of the biggest points is there's a, a huge reduction in risk to medical personnel that have to administer the test. You don't have to be six inches away from someone's face uh, to be able to take a sample. So not being exposed um, or having you know, healthcare professionals exposed that are uh, equally, if not more var uh, valuable in taking care of patients, especially in a time like this, um, is really uh, incredible. It also obviates the need for, for PPE, which is also in huge demand. So at the first drive-through sites that we opened, from seven in the morning, to about 7 p.m. at night, you could do about 250 samples um, uh, in collection, and it takes about 25 to 30 minutes per sample with um, donning and gowning, having to change everything before every patient, um, and then also having limiting supplies so things were being reused that really shouldn't. In the second day of changing the saliva collection, they quadrupled their throughput in half the time. They were done by one o'clock, had close to 800 samples, and then I'd open up their schedules because when I described the process, those of you that, that have had an experience with an MP um, a test or administering it will see the difference. Now, if we talk about a more robust sample, you know, it, it, it's not lost on anybody that the business end of the swab is the synthetic tip. And, and there's a finite surface area to that synthetic tip that can come in contact with anything that would have the virus, any cells that you would dislodge, or any mucus or sputum um, that's in the respiratory tract. And, and I'm not arguing that that's not a more concentrated sample at some level, and that's not a place that the virus loves to live. It's dark, it's warm. Um, however, the, th the surface area has a maximum capacity. Versus on the right-hand side, looking at a saliva collection device where you collect two mLs of saliva. So, so just based under the premise that you have more stuff you have a more robust collection event. It doesn't rely on the, the quality of the collection for the healthcare professional, or even you know, the, the, the state of the patient and what you might get, whether you're lucky or unlucky, and what you can grab on the, on the tip of that swab, especially um, uh, for people that are extremely uncomfortable or you know, really um, uh, very, very ill. And, and the other thing to keep in mind that we thought about as biomaterial experts that makes a lot of sense is that you know, six weeks ago or so, or maybe two months ago now, um, every day seems to be the same. Um, CNN looked at, you know, what happens when you sneeze and you cough and, you know, your, your, your saliva, anything that's coming from your respiratory tracts aerosolized and travels 33 feet when you sneeze or cough. Well, I think maybe sneeze was 33 feet, cough was like 25 feet. But the fact of the matter is, 
wear wearing masks, not only to protect ourselves, but protect spreading anything that we might be if we're asymptomatic and shedding virus, that aerosolization is coming from your saliva um, in, in, in large part. And these are, these are the actual devices. In the cap is a preservation agent. Um, that preservation agent has a chaotropic um, uh, chemical in there that when released into the saliva, protects it uh, for transport. Um, we've done studies for summer and winter simulations for transport, as well as we know at least up to 10 days it's uh, stable at, um, at room temperature. And here you can see how easy the collection is. So um, that's it. That's, that's the long and the short of it. Spit up to the line, uh, screw the cap on. We know that samples are properly preserved if they're blue when they come back. And we also measure the volume of every sample that comes in to ensure uh, that we have an appropriate amount of saliva. As you can imagine, some people, overachievers, want to spit over the line. Uh, some people spit under the line. Um, but we have a determination to make sure that the sample was collected properly. And then how do you, how do you implement this uh, aside from, you know, a healthcare professional handing it to you, spinning it up to the line and, and handing it back? Well, you know, today in, in, in the COVID environment, uh, right now, all diagnostic tests or presumptive diagnoses are done um, under the guidance of, of a healthcare professional, at least under the order of a physician. There is no approved asymptomatic, truly asymptomatic testing. So we have to apply screening tools. And one of the three ways you could get a device would either be to be in a hospital or an ambulatory care facility under the care of a physician that's partnered with a, 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 you know, um, a testing lab that's offering the screen. But the other is to use screening tools. Um, and there's a, a CDC screening tool or guidelines that's a, a, a self-assessment that most uh, telehealth companies have uh, added to their process. Um, once you do that, you can register for the test. It's dropped off at your door overnight. Uh, you through a telehealth platform, you take the test. Um, they identify that you're the right person, um, that there has been an order placed either by them or by your physician. Um, you put the sample back in the package, you pop it off to the lab the next day, and uh, 24 to 36 hours later, you, your results are posted. So this kind of a scalable system, which can be used for broad population testing once truly asymptomatic testing is approved, but even now with a very large number of people that have you know, been identified of having significant risk or coming in contact, which also applies for a physician order, will be done. And, and as of Monday, with the governor's announcement, we'll, we'll be the first state to implement this truly innovative process. Now, how New Jersey is gonna roll that out is still being determined, but the technology is there, the process is there, and most importantly, um, the, the investment's been made by New Jersey to support that, uh, which will get a, us up to, and then ultimately beyond 50,000 tests a day. Um, it's a fail safe process, ensures the test is delivered, monitored, returned to the lab, and everything else beyond that's electronic. Um, it's a streamlined process, simple. The kit is, as we described, has a biohazard bag, your test kit, an alcohol prep pad for wiping down the outside of the device and the outside of the package. Everything else is done online or through your physician, through all of the telehealth platforms um, that you all may be using, and then the results are sent um, to the local agencies. So what happens inside the lab? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, all we've done is, is highly automated. You extract viral RNA from the saliva. Uh, we use a bead-based method. Um, there are 96 samples turned out every four, uh, 40 minutes per instrument. Then a series of, of liquid handlers reformat samples into a 384 well plate. Um, we add the probes and primers that are required to amplify uh, the cDNA that comes from that, uh, that sample. We're looking for three targets, um, uh, nucleocapsid gene, a, um, 
uh, a gene for the spike of the virus as well as the ORF1AB region. Um, there are many different ways that you can do this. Um, if anyone's interested, I can describe why three, why the partner we had chosen. But suffice it to say, it's, it's a quantitative PCR reaction. We then can make qualitative and quantitative assessments. If you run a calibrator along with this, we can actually calculate the, uh, the number of copies. Um, and again, the, the, the clinical trial I mentioned before, as, as well as some other trials out of CINJ that are looking at um, uh, different treatments, uh, we'll be doing quantitative assessment and looking at uh, the decrease in viral shedding or persistent infection as a function of viral load. So even though the diagnostic's qualitative, having these tools have helped facilitate um, a number of clinical trials that we're running with uh, DaVita uh, Health, uh, one that just started with BMS. We're running um, all of Verily's uh, clinical trials, uh, you know, which is the Google healthcare company, uh, in, in these same approaches. So the, the study design that got us our EUA, and, and for those that don't know, because we, we didn't know until two months ago, uh, the FDA started this emergency use authorization process. Um, it, it is not similar to the 510K process. It's not similar to the IVD process that we're all similar, familiar with for those of us that do development of assays, whether it be a laboratory developed task, test or a medical device. Um, at first, because nobody knew how to get samples, even though there were a lot of people that were infected and it was craziness, the FDA allowed for contrived samples where we could take viral transcripts, spike them in and use them as surrogates. That's no longer allowed. And, and in fact, we, we didn't do that. Um, we went straight to subjects. We partnered with Accurate Diagnostic Labs, which is the largest independently owned reference lab in uh, New Jersey. And uh, with their physician practices, went right to patients. Um, we collected over 60, but the first 60, as soon as we had our statistics were submitted, we used independently verified clinical status of samples. They were all symptomatic patients across three hospitals. Um, we collected swabs in universal transfer media <clears throat> when they were still, <coughs> excuse me, remotely available. And then we used a, a saliva collection device from Spectrum Solutions. The reason that we worked with the Spectrum Solutions device is we've been working with them for many, many years. They're the, the largest manufacturer and have the, the, the broadest number of solutions to choose from. So we knew what we would have to do in order to stabilize this virus and, and most importantly, or more importantly, or equally importantly, inactivate it. Now, the big part about this trial is samples were collected at the same time, where if you look at many studies and there are multiple tests per patient, we know that everyone's infectious journey is very different, um, even their clinical course. And we have patients that are on ventilators that have less of a viral load than those that complain of a headache um, or those that, uh, are asymptomatic even. So it was important that the sample collections were done at the same time. The patient was given the saliva collection device, handed back, the physician gowned up, did the MP swab, put it in the media, came back to the same lab, the same instruments processed at the same time, and all samples were processed within 72 hours of collection. And we also did a, a direct comparison in looking at the same volume of that universal transfer media and the same volume of um, a saliva. So again, more to my point, we take that swab, we dilute it in three mLs of, of universal transfer media, and we have 300 microliters of saliva, which is one and a half mLs of preservation agent. So the mass of, of the biological material is an order of magnitude greater than what we have for the swab. Uh, and then we use the same sample volume in the qPCR detection. And it's a very clean, Test. For those of you that, that have never looked at qPCR results, um, every cycle of PCR, there's a, a probe that's attached to that specific sequence. If that probe, if that template is in the solution, the enzyme cleaves a fluorophore from that probe, which then lights up. So if we look at every cycle, that increasing curve shows there's more and more sample made through PCR, and we can determine the absolute level of when it was detected. So Here's a, 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 a viral transcript that's spiked in um, to every sample that has nothing to do with, um, with COVID-2 that we're supposed to detect in every positive and negative sample that's run. We then look at the three genes, uh, the N gene, the S gene, and the ORF1AB. 
And here's the result in a positive um, um, uh, patient that you can see the different viral load for these three different, um, uh, these three different genes, N, ORF1AB, and S. And the negatives, there's absolutely no signal. So it's a very clean test. The swabs give very, very you know, give variable results based on the, um, you know, the, the level of detection. But you can see up to the very small viral load and high viral load, we can detect across the continuum. And this is just some examples of samples. And if we look at saliva, um, you see something very similar, and you would expect it to see. You'd see you expect to see the same performance with the viral uh, uh, um, controls that are spiked in. No results for the negatives. But here, I don't know if you can notice from the previous slide for swabs, and I know it's small, this is a CT of about 30 to give you a point of reference. When we go to saliva, here's the same 30. So what we're finding is the overall amount of virus across the same patients is more robust. So if you had a swab distribution that was here and a saliva distribution that's here, it really doesn't matter because the patient's still positive and we had 100% correlation between swabs and saliva. Um, and this just shows uh, the negative controls. But what I, the, the point I'm trying to make is here you can see the swab data and the saliva data from the same exact patients. The same distribution, right, in, in viral load, but more sensitive in saliva in that we have more virus that we can detect. Now, if we ran a calibrator, you know, we'd be able to calculate the number of copies per ml. And what this would translate into is more copies per ml of solution, greater chance of detecting this in the patient. So, so the data summary real quick from the study, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. In case any of you are interested, and I know these slides are gonna be posted, this is the data from the contrived sample validation. We were challenged to make a 95% confidence level um, uh, for the actual test in agreement for one to two times level of detection. We were at 100%. Uh, same thing for um, our observed results in real samples. We were at 100%. This is the, uh, the cutoffs that are used for CT values. This is now all automated. So once a threshold is set for the instrument, the calls are made and it goes into our database, is converted to an HL7 format, is uploaded to any of our partners' EMRs for reporting. Uh, there, are, there are portals for a patient reporting. And, and the summary here is you know, pretty, pretty clear that we had 100% positive and negative agreement for our contrived samples, but the bigger deal is the 100% agreement on all clinical samples. Now, this was done in a very controlled environment. We watched every sample. We made sure it was collected in the proper way, which we appreciate is not what happens in a, in a more, uh, in, in a critical care environment, um, even in an ambulatory care facility. We have to allot for what some of those changes would be. But the fact is, if the sample is handled properly with a methodology that has a very robust preservation solution, a very robust process, that we expect to see high level um, agreement. Um, a week ago, the FDA approved the first at-home saliva collection for coronavirus. Uh, this is that instrument I was talking about, and we have lots of them in different pieces because of our, 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 scan, our, our scale. And, and the reason that we got this um, assignment was because of the preservation agent and the stability of that sample that's being collected. And because it's safe to transport because of the inactivation of the virus, and because it's safe for the patient that's collecting it at home. And without going into too detail, there, there's a lot that, you know, um, th th there's a lot that goes into that. And the FDA reminds me repeatedly that it's not just the efficiency of the test, but it's the safety of the people in which they're authorizing these tests. So we have a variety of, of, of um, authorizations and state certifications now. Our first EUA approval on swab and saliva, which has been expanded now, um, for self-collection of swab as well, um, NARES as, as well as midturbinate um, is one EUA. And then uh, a week ago, which seems like a lifetime, um, was the home collection of this saliva. And what we have under review now, um, again, thanks to the healthcare study at Rutgers, is uh, a true asymptomatic comparison of um, COVID patients where we see a 96, per, in the samples we've tested, 
and these are real patient samples, obviously, a 96% correlation between swab and saliva for all patients. And the difference of that 4%, 1.3% is where the swab detected it, but the saliva did not. And, and the 2.6% or 2.7% is where the swab did not detect it, but the saliva did, which points towards, again, an equal or more robust collection for saliva and a real world example of what we could expect for concordance for properly validated um, tests. We also have New Jersey Department of Health approval as well as New York. I think there are only four states now in the union that we don't have a, approval for and we're waiting on two remaining CLIA licenses will allow us to test across the US in hospitals using telehealth providers and healthcare networks so that Rutgers can help make a contribution um, towards you know, this, this, this terrible series of events. This is just, you know, we're very proud of this. We're gonna frame it, we're gonna hang it up. We're never gonna take it down, but stay tuned. Um, we're working on an exciting saliva-based immunity test that also uses PCR. So imagine if you can collect a single saliva sample, be able to determine infectivity or, or the shedding of virus, as well as whether or not you have uh, come in contact with the virus previously and have mounted some kind of an immune response. We, we don't know what that immune response means, how long it lasts. Um, we have interesting data to show that there are patients that don't convert to an immune response and some that take 30 or 40 days and some actually have IgG at the time they're actively infected. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on the interpretation of that data, but we're work is, you know, focusing on, on, on the testing side of it. So the last kind of thing I want to leave you with is I started off by describing, you know, the role of RUCDR and, and our view on the world from a biomaterial standpoint is that what we do still doesn't just apply to COVID. Um, and this is a great opportunity to explain to scientists and, and, and physicians through these kinds of venues, the importance of the biomaterial. Everyone, whether we like it or not, has an individual biobank footprint, just like we have a digital footprint. You know, you go on LinkedIn once and you're there forever. You go on Facebook, you can take your cells off, but people have saved things and downloaded things, you're there forever. Um, and there are companies that are dedicated to removing your digital footprint, albeit I'm not sure how successful they are. It's the same thing in healthcare. We have a data and biosample footprint that will follow us for the rest of our lives. And if I look as an example, this little girl who developed into a woman at five years old has tonsillitis, gets a tonsillectomy. In some basement somewhere in some hospital, there is an FFP block with tissue from that surgery. It may not mean anything, a source of, of, of DNA or RNA for future studies, but that's the first footprint. Then at 18 years old, she finds a skin lesion, goes to a dermatologist. Now not only is there additional tissue stored in some other hospital, and, and as you all know, there are legal requirements for holding on to this kind of tissue, um, as well as molecular components. But now there's other data to maybe look at, you know, dysplastic cells or other things, and it turns out she was fine, but that data exists. Then at 20 years old, she decides to spit in a tube, just like we're doing for corona. Saliva is used to extract, you know, to get DNA. And she may decide to, you know, post her data online somewhere, which I think less people are doing now. But either way, now you have a, a, a full genetic profile of an individual and samples being stored. And Ancestry.com saves every sample. They have automated storage that holds 40 million aliquots from every sample they've tested. Then at 30 years old, the same woman decides to, you know, I shouldn't say donate her eggs, but to preserve her eggs. She may not have a partner. She may not be in the right place to have, uh, uh, considering having a family, but she doesn't want to miss the opportunity so now there are IVF clinics that hold on to live tissue, whether they're, they're oocytes or embryos, and you have a, a living tissue bank of your own tissue with all of the data associated, increasing your footprint. 35 years old, you're, you're diagnosed with hypertension, you go into a pharma clinical trial, you have blood in all of this data, which people don't realize they have access to. At 55 years old, you know, I'm gaining weight, I'm not exercising right, I wanna learn about myself, wellness monitoring, they, they send stool to thrive. They do urinalyses for, for um, genetic predisposition for athletic performance, all of these different things and looking at more DNA. Now you're actually using this data in a function of developing those markers. 
And then unfortunately at 70 years old, you're diagnosed with cancer, you have tissue, blood, you go through treatment, you're in a trial. And, and, and we look at that snapshot in time as to how that could help or the efficacy of that trial when if we had a way to manage this information and have access to this, the outcome here could be very different. And, and it's really all about a function of, you know, data, the biosamples associated with them and the analytes that are stored and, and how as an academic medical center, we have tremendous opportunities. And, and this is what an organization like RUCDR does. And sadly now, you know, we can add COVID-19 samples to that footprint, which millions of people are going to have at the end of the day associated with their electronic medical records. So, so I'll stop there and, and hopefully this was um, informative and gave you some insight about what we're doing at the level of the lab for uh, COVID-19 testing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brooks. I know you only have a couple minutes. I know you have a, another meeting at one o'clock. Um, this is, uh, I'm getting lots of, um, lots of comments in here. So I think what we'll do is maybe just one kind of summary question that I'm getting from a bunch of, a bunch of people. And then you can give us a 30 second spiel on, on what your next um, presentation is about. Cause I think that'll be really interesting. But we do have, as Natalia discussed, we have, we've had many patients who have one, two, three biochemical negative testing while they're in the hospital, but clinically clearly have a course and symptoms and findings that are consistent with COVID-19. So the questions are, and as you mentioned before, the viral loads don't correlate with the clinical outcomes. So the question is, how can we use the tests that are available, including the saliva testing, to augment how we can diagnose these patients? Sure. It's, it's, um, it's a great question. And <clears throat> one I unfortunately don't have a, a complete answer for, but we'll uh, point you towards the guidance from the EUA, which um, what they coin as uh, euphemistic phrasing for presumptive diagnoses is that if you test negative, um, given any testing paradigm, and it's in our EUA for saliva, um, that should not be considered a final diagnosis if there is clinical relevance to tell you otherwise. So my suggestion would be to look at, um, uh, if possible, multiple testing sources. So our lab will do bronchoalveolar lavage, we will do swabs, we will do saliva. And we have seen in, in, in numbers of patients that for one reason or another, that collection may or may not work. Certainly the correlation is high in most patients but if there's you know, um, a clinical indication that that is not correct, that guidance would say that you should take it by another means. And until recently, there weren't many additional choices. Now there are. Um, and for other molecular tests, you know, there's PCR, um, there's antigen testing, there, there are lots of other opportunities. So identifying you know, a path in, you know, in your clinical care setting might be either prioritizing or having a practice of one, you know, sampling and then another if, if the result is different than what you thought. So that's one, one suggestion. Um, the, uh, the, the next meeting that I'm going on to actually is a function of an announcement that the, uh, the governor made um, immediately after the announcement of we're going to increase and um, expand with uh, uh, FEMA money um, the testing at Rutgers to get people, you know, back into society and back to work. And that is the immediate attention uh, for long-term care facilities, um, uh, nursing homes, and um, uh, all of the workers in, in nursing homes. You know, as everyone knows and hears in the news, these are, are unfortunately facilities that have had varied access to testing and have had some really bad outcomes, unfortunately, because of um, you know, the predisposition of, of these patients um, just on age alone in some cases. So this is where the state's focus, their attention has asked us to help. Unfortunately, it comes only three days after the directive of test every inmate and every officer at every correctional facility um, because of the unfortunate clinical outcome of some officers and other things that are happening. So uh, we're working with the state and all of the organizations around long-term care facilities to use some of the approaches that I described um, because this is an instance where patients cannot come to us 
and we need to have a hybrid of getting the test to the patient um, and being able to test efficiently to start uh, to protect um, uh, that community, so. Great, wonderful. We do have a lot of questions in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna email Dr. Brooks with some of these questions and in his uh, spare few moments that he has when he's uh, not working, maybe he'll get these back to us and I can send it out to the group, whoever's, whoever's here, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brooks. Thank you for the case presentation. This is, uh, this is fantastic. All right, thank you all. Have thank a great you. day and be well. Thank you. We'll see you next week for the Grand Rounds, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.